Good morning, everyone. Yeah, hold on. Yeah, I'm on. Uh, pleasure seeing you. I think most of us have forgotten how to shake hands and things like that. So I know I was a bit confused coming up here. Uh, but I'm going to hopefully tell you a story about people rather than coffee. Uh, but because coffee is a nice platform to talk about people. And uh, this came about, maybe it became more intense about six years ago. Uh, me and my wife had started a coffee business already, a roasting company in Addis. Uh, she runs the business uh, and manages it because uh, I'm more of a follow the question kind of person rather than manage what's working already. And uh, the thing I discovered in that questions and uh, following people's stories and the like was the way Ethiopian coffee is related globally uh, and the many assumptions that are embedded in that uh, were not really the coffee that I grew up knowing. I didn't realize that I knew coffee until I got into coffee and I also didn't realize that I didn't know about coffee until I got into coffee, so, uh, which is kind of a tough place to be uh, for someone that comes from a scientific background. So by training, uh, I'm a biochemist, and uh, after I joined the coffee sector, I became a coffee economist as well. So in the biochemistry world, you ask questions, you see whether that's true or not, and then you dig deeper. So in that process is where I got here. And the Ethiopian experience became clear to me when I was attending my school at Eli Cafe doing my master's program there. We've had a chance to maybe, you know, the, the dozens after dozens of lecturers who come and give a presentation about a particular topic about coffee. There will be a seed expert that comes and talks about seed of coffee, the genetics of coffee, the sustainability of coffee, the processing of coffee. And whenever I had questions based on what I knew about the Ethiopian context, the answer was, oh, yeah, except in Ethiopia. And when that gets repeated far too many times, then you go like, what is it that's so different about Ethiopian coffee? And one thing I realized was a lot of it might seem natural, and it is true, and, but a lot of it is also cultural. So it gave me the opportunity to explore that aspect of it a great deal. And I became more interested in domestic consumption in the Ethiopian context, uh, but also in other East African context, uh, because they seem to have a system that is more similar to Ethiopia than other parts of the world. To give you context, uh, Brazil and Vietnam are the largest coffee producing countries, the top two. Uh, for me, whether it's Arabica or Robusta, it doesn't really matter. I come from the attitude that coffee is coffee, the only thing I want is good coffee and the people who make it. So it's the people and the good coffee I'm after, not the species or the variety that person deals with. So in that journey, one thing I discovered was uh, maybe it's about time to look at Ethiopian coffee differently and focus on the consumption side of things. And maybe that exception that people recognized but never really talked about at the coffee professional side of things is something that is a niche market for Ethiopia to really flourish in. And in, when I got this invitation from SCA Rico uh, to reflect a bit more the common thing that I found between the specialty coffee side of things and the Ethiopian coffee side of things is its value for experience and people. So it really thrives on the experience side of things. It really thrives on, on the people side of things, uh, more so than just the coffee of it. So uh, I kind of called it learning from the spiritual home of specialty coffee uh, because I feel like Ethiopia is uh, a pioneer in the specialty coffee. It looks more behind the curve uh, because I feel like it's on the 10th wave of coffee, uh, you know, revisit rather than the third or the fourth wave, okay? 
Uh, and I got to reflect on that because a friend of mine who's an American and uh, a few other colleagues said, you know, I'm trying to come up with a company name for a business that I was thinking of starting back in those days when we were in school. And uh, they're like, you know, there's so many phases that you went through as a coffee culture. And so I didn't know how many phases we went through because we've had centuries after centuries of coffee consumption. So 10 seemed the appropriate number. Uh, but never really started that company for the simple reason that uh, my curiosity doesn't lend to, it lends to too many ideas, but doesn't necessarily get traction along the way. So here, I just want to reframe, you know, Will was speaking about Vietnam. And I also want you to reframe your perspective about Ethiopia and how you see it. Uh, these are the top nine coffee consuming countries in the world, at least the importer ones, okay? So if Ethiopia was a coffee importing country, it would be in the top nine. If you use Ethiopian data, it would be between France and Italy, okay? If you use ICO data, it would be ninth, and the tenth one would be the UK. And I'm sure most of you would love to go into the UK, France, or Italy and consider them to be significant global markets. Uh, what makes Ethiopia very unique is that the average real GDP per capita is $2,300. Okay? So it's a very poor country that commits on average 8 to 10. A daily laborer will commit 8 to 10% of their daily income to coffee consumption in Ethiopia. So that's how committed we are. It's a, it's a social drink as well. So the evolution of coffee in Ethiopia is mostly social and spiritual. It was never economical. And three decades ago, if you served an Ethiopian coffee and asked for payment, it would be an abomination. It would be okay if you were served with a machine coffee, an espresso coffee. But if it is traditional Ethiopian coffee and you ask for payment, then people will start looking at you a bit differently. Uh, and the other thing about Ethiopian is coffee and the people that make it is the simplicity behind it. Uh, fresh roast, fresh brew. Ethiopia is also one of the few places that I know that consumes coffee in every way possible. Okay. In Ethiopia, we drink the leaf as tea. We drink the leaf as a roasted coffee product. We consume the husk as a tea. We also consume the husk as a milk-based drink, mixing it after roasting with milk. Uh, we also consume it, the bean. Uh, we consume it as food. You know, there isn't really anything left with coffee except maybe the barks. But uh, I'm sure we'll find some use for them soon. And uh, so this beauty and simplicity is, uh, by the way, later on you'll see this drink. This is a, a coffee leaf tea. We will be serving it uh, later in the afternoon in the sensory experience side of things. Uh, I'm going to take you back a few slides. This one is coffee with butter. You'll also spiced butter. You'll also get to experience it in the sensory lab. Uh, the idea of... Uh, you know, you know, spice-infused butter mixed with a coffee as a drink uh, w would seem odd, but uh, thanks to the keto diet, it seems to be in the thing now. So, uh, you know, but uh, this has been the norm in the many parts of Ethiopia. And another thing that I want you to appreciate with Ethiopia is that Ethiopia has both the natural as well as the cultural aspect of things. Both of them are always present. However, the experience part always outshines the two. So the two are the background. The reason I'm highlighting this guy is it's a picture that a friend of mine from Germany came and visited. And I took him on a safari uh, to kind of help me with documenting a few pictures for a book that hopefully someday will come out, but uh, God knows. 
Uh, and uh, this is a hippo in Lake Tana. Lake Tana is one of the five biosphere reserves that is recognized by UNESCO in Ethiopia. And all five of them have coffee in them. Okay, four of them natural forest coffees. This one, an adapted forest system, but coffee was introduced into the forest system a few hundred years back. This one is a drink I make. Uh, it's uh, basically coffee infused honey mead with espresso on top of it, okay? Ethiopians make honey mead, it's a traditional drink, it's an alcohol drink, and when you were in the nobility back in the days, we used to make it infused with coffee. So now I'm trying to experiment, is there a way to make it into a cocktail kind of drink? Uh, and uh, it tastes awesome. You're drunk as well as awake at the same time, so. <laughs> which is nice. Uh, the other, the, in Ethiopia, you know, coffee is spiritual as well. You know, we've had uh, Judaism for a few thousand years, Christianity for a few thousand years, and Islam for a few thousand years. Almost all of them came at the early stages of their existence. But in all that, coffee in Ethiopia as a ceremony is also a spiritual ceremony. So if you ever visited an Ethiopian or know an Ethiopian have been one of those places when they do coffee ceremony, the reason they have grasses on the floor, they throw some kind of food, grain on the floor is an offering for the spirits. The, the way they uh, use incense, frankincense and the like to give aroma to the space, uh, everything is connected. So think of it that way. And, uh, so it's also politics in Ethiopia, coffee, okay? Uh, and unfortunately, it doesn't sit well with the consumption-driven culture of Ethiopian coffee. And I'll explain a bit what that means. Here, uh, I'm just gonna give you a little, there's a good, the bad, and the ugly wherever you go. Uh, and it's just figuring that out. And then what are you gonna do to highlight the good? What are you gonna do to keep the bad, at least stay bad? And what are you gonna do to change the ugly into better? So think of them as a cycle. Here, uh, I give trainings in Ethiopia as part of the different business model trials I do. So uh, I try different things uh, and whatever works become a business and if it becomes a business, I hand it over to my wife. She's willing to at least take that because she doesn't trust me once something works, I might ruin it. So by asking unnecessary questions. Uh, here, the one common feature, these are farmers and extension workers in the government office. I don't give trainings to the two of them separately. I give them together. The reason is that in Ethiopia, coffee processors uh, have a an amazing set of skills that are not necessarily known by the coffee professionals that are supposed to give them extension supports. The reason I say that is coffee fermentation in Ethiopia has been known for centuries. Uh, actually, one of the things that came up in my engagement with many coffee importers, especially those that are older, is that I don't get the flavors I used to get some 30, 40 years ago. It has changed. What has changed is that the processing method. In the past three, four decades, Ethiopia has been aggressively pushing the washing method and the African beds and the like, so it changed the flavor. But in many communities, especially those communities that are not directly linked with the coffee system that Ethiopia has established to maximize the income it gets out of coffee, they still do a lot of traditional fermentation processings. And, uh, the profile is so amazing that sometimes makes you wonder, uh, is it really technology, uh, the most recent way that's technology, or technology, you know, it's like using a pigeon to send a message and using a cell phone to send a message, and uh, maybe both have uses. Uh, one is no better than another, depending on context, might be the best way to look at it. So. I try to find ways to maximize the relationship between the two. In this training, when I offer it, the farmers 
will say, we will still do some of the things you would like us to do to make the coffee go out for export. However, we will not abandon our traditional way of processing coffee. And maybe there's a lesson to be learned there. Another one I want you to look at is, in Ethiopia, the strategy has been, with this aggressive focus on foreign currency generation, is that we actually don't promote domestic consumption at the policy level. We try to mitigate consumption. That's how powerful it is, the domestic market. Uh, and in this regard, you know, Ethiopians know this. Uh, it's the Lalibela Church. It's made out of one rock. It was carved some 800 plus years ago. Uh, it's, uh, we made it at a time where it was difficult for Ethiopians to pilgrim to Jerusalem, so it was designed as a new Jerusalem. Okay? And uh, here, coffee also grows, a little bit outside of it. It was introduced by priests some 200 years ago. And it's a place more to the north than to other places that you know. And uh, coffee still grows there. And places like that, as well as places like Gurage Zone, where the butter was uh, coffee is more famous for, the domestic market is so powerful in the local environment that there's no way they will find your specialty coffee prices attractive enough, okay? So at any given day, coffee cost, even from the southern Sidama region, Zirga Chafe, coffee from that area costs more, okay? So it's, uh, the reason though they grow it is not to pay for it. You know, Ethiopians say, you know what? I have a piece of land. I could throw in a few trees there and at least decrease the amount of money I have to pay out of pocket for coffee. And here the other, you know, gems of Ethiopia is not just the domestic market, but really the biotechnology and tourism side of things. The cultural aspect of coffee is so integrated in every aspect of our life that it really is a way to bring the natural and the cultural side and tell that story through coffee. And uh, it is also my hope that, you know, the best place Ethiopia could be is in the seed industry of the coffee sector, because coffee doesn't have a seed industry. My background is biochemistry. I specialize in biotechnology. So for me, the ideal place for Ethiopia to focus on would be the tourism and the biotech side of things, because it's human resource development, better income, and you leave the domestic market to dictate what the production outcomes will be serving, whether, rather than forcing them to export good quality coffee. And there isn't a single country in the world that does that. Producing countries don't force their producers to legally export good quality coffee. Ethiopia does. Okay, that's another unique one. I've asked many producing countries, the friends I've had there, if there is any such law in their countries. And in Ethiopia, once a coffee is qualified as export grade, it has to go out. So these are two stories. One from Uganda, another one. I just want to give you a context where you could take it forward. Uh, Indiro is basically a US company that seems to be operating in the Uganda, but it's not. It's a partnership. There's a Ugandan side to it and there's a US side to it, but when you look at it, the setup, everything, it feels like I was in a cafe in the US. The reason I got fascinated was when I was driving from Entebbe to Mbale, there were about three, four of them I saw. And I'm like, a coffee chain in Uganda? And good coffee, the espresso was awesome. Uh, but their story is a bit different because uh, they're a B Corp in the US side of things and the partners. Uh, and there aren't even a lot of B Corps in the US and they already are a B Corp. And their presence in the retail side in Uganda gives them a unique perspective. This one is the first coffee roasting company in Ethiopia, a modern one. By the way, Ethiopians don't roast their coffee the modern way. It's still 85% of the coffee in Ethiopia is roasted fresh immediately by the person who's about to drink it, okay? It's home roasted. So, you know, I'm sure cropsters and others will not be a big fan of that because uh, <laughs> it would be very hard to document. Uh, this is just to give you numbers. I used Rwanda as a benchmark because it's a, one of the smallest countries. It's the ninth in Africa. So there are 12 countries that produce coffee. It produces between about 21,000 tons. 
uh, you know, here's a number, you know, Ethiopia is 50% plus, but actually it's about 60% because Ethiopia doesn't really document the numbers that comes out of places that are not considered major coffee growing areas in Ethiopia. Uh, and they produce more coffee than Kenya. So those not so significant areas in Ethiopia. So, uh, and what I want you to see is that here it is, Ethiopia. In terms of consumption wise, almost 3,700 fold more than Rwanda, okay? Population wise though, it's only nine times bigger. Income wise, they're pretty much the same. So even if you look at Brazil, Indonesia, and Vietnam, you know, this number is ICO number, just to make it even across the board. But the Ethiopian number is slightly bigger than this because the minor regions that grow coffee are not really incorporated in the national number schemes that we report to ICO. So the way forward, my last slide I'm going to reflect on is coffee for me is shared spaces. Uh, in Ethiopia, even if we consume and drink a lot of coffee, there's a lot of opportunity for interaction for both Ethiopians and non-Ethiopians to learn, talk about coffee. And there's a fascination. You will never know what kind of questions that pop up when you start discussing coffee from different angles. Uh, and ultimately, it's also about the values. The, the thing that makes Ethiopian coffee system work is that the value exists across the board, meaning that a young lady who's finished school and not sure of what to do but needs income could literally go in the street, buy the pieces that she needs to make coffee and start making good quality coffee uh, and start supporting family immediately. That's how powerful coffee is in Ethiopia. You don't need a coffee house. You don't need a license. You don't do anything. You just literally go in the corner and set it up. From a house to my garage, where I take my cars for fixing, it's about 500 meters walk. And there are about 12 people who make such coffee. And in Ethiopia, the unique part about it is everything is women driven. The only time the men show up is when it became a business some five, six decades ago. Uh, that Ethiopia decided to generate foreign currency from coffee. Before that, everything about it was women, it still is. That's my sister on the left, my aunt, and this is my grandma. Even though she passed away, that's her favorite cup that my aunt still saves. And whenever we celebrate her memorial on April 3rd, that cup comes out. And she passed away 15 years ago. And we still do that. So coffee is ever present. And it is also, this consumption culture, I think, is the solution for quality as well as livelihood. Because the specialty coffee sector, livelihood is important. In the specialty coffee sector, quality is very important. If you let domestic consumption develop, it actually is not going to take away anything. It just means that people are going to get more out of the coffee, so they will invest more in it. If they invest more in it, they will compete with each other. If they compete with each other, they produce good, fine coffees. And like I said, I don't care whether it's Robusta or Arabica. I'm more interested in good coffee and good people. So that's the story. Thank you so much for listening. <laughs>